Hello, everyone, and welcome to How to Get Your Scary Shit Done. Five super simple steps that'll help you go from idea to done. I confessed as we were getting started and fussing with technology a minute ago, those of you listening to the recording won't have uh, participated in, that I'm actually nervous. And it's kind of funny because I teach a lot. I teach a lot in person, Facebook Live, on the Writer's Oasis. When we're doing GSSD, I'm live like this every week. So I was really interested in why I was nervous. And um, I realized it's because I care about this stuff so much. It's not that I don't care about all my teaching, but there's something about this course and, and the ideas that I'll offer you today that feel so, um, so much, I hate to use this word because it's got a lot of baggage with it, but isn't the way I mean it, but legacy. It feels like I'm coming into the time in my life when I'm really looking at what are the teachings and the ideas that I've been taught and or designed or mashed together that, that really matter to me to pass on. And this, this get scary shit done material um, is, is part of that. that. And so I, I just feel like, wow, can I express clearly enough a distillation of those ideas so that you will get something from this hour? And so I just want to presence that. It always makes me feel better to be um, just as I am and to make space and welcome how I am. So thank you for allowing me to do that. Um, if you're just joining, if you for any reason come on video, um, in your left hand corner, you can hit stop video and you'll go away. And you can ask questions in your um, chat box. Um, and we will have a chance to come on screen if you want to ask a question on video. If you're listening via phone, no worry. I will describe what's going in the chat box, um, read some questions, and, and try to give you the most auditory experience that I can. I want to say that um, there's a part of me that thought calling this um, five super simple steps to help you go from idea to done was like, ew, that sounds like one of those like marketing, you know, internet bro titles for a course. But the truth is, this stuff is super simple. <laughs> it's not getting your scary shit done. It's not about being smarter. It's not about, um, it's not about being any different than you are. It's actually about getting out of your own way. And I sometimes joke that it would be nice if I could just take a few IQ points away from everyone while they're learning this because it is really simple, but we dismiss it. I want to talk about what the course is for Get Scary Shit Done first. Um, I don't feel like I have to like trick you into loving this material because it's so good. And if you have no intention of taking the course, you'll still be so happy you spent this 45 minutes and then you can stay on for Q&A. Um, and if you are thinking about the course, I just want to talk about it very briefly. And I'll talk about it again a little bit at the end and take questions about that and anything else. Um, so GSSD, as we call it in short, is a seven week course during which you choose a project that you wanna work on and complete, and you go from start to working on it consistently to completing it. <laughs> and if the word complete immediately makes you go, ah, oh, don't freak it out, I'm freaking out. That is part of what the course is about. It's helping you really understand what is completion, what is finish, finishing, how do you have power over that? How do you declare? And what we really, really learn, and, and if you take the course, I believe you'll learn, is how much more, um, how we think we can get done in seven weeks than we really can and what a lesson that is. So it's really baked into the course. The way it works is you get an email every Monday and we release one module per week. The learning builds on each other. Those modules are taught in video lessons and audios and templates and notes and all kinds of different ways that you can take the learning in, in small snippets that are fun and interesting. Certain lessons have asterisks next to them. Those are the ones you really need to do in order. There's a lots of extra material that you can dive into if or when you want and it's yours for a lifetime to download or to go on the platform and access so there's no sense of getting behind and more than 50% of people who did GSSD last in the spring wait a minute is this fall in the spring <laughs> are redoing it again they're coming on for the live portion so because they're going to do another project um, and then on Thursdays, we have a live implementation call, just like this one, where I'm here and we're talking. You can come on screen and ask questions. You can ask in the chat box, really fun, problem solving, you know, anything that's not clear and lots of support and love. 
Um, oh, wait, Melanie just said the live calls are on Tuesday. Oh, right, they're on Tuesday. They're on Tuesdays, Melanie? But they're not on Thursdays, they're on Tuesdays. <laughs> this is why I have got people like Melanie in my life, Melanie and Erin, who are my team, who are gonna be doing their scary ship projects along with me and along with all of you in the course. So the, the, the main point I wanna make here, and then let's get into the material, is how many times have you started something you care about? Maybe it's the same project, maybe it's a writing project, maybe it's a business building project, maybe it's an online course you wanna do, maybe it's a health thing, maybe it's a home thing, fixing something or finishing something in your home, and you got stopped somewhere. Get some stop somewhere or started circling around or you lost interest, you couldn't get over a hump or a dip or a blank spot. And the difference with this course is you won't stop and you will figure out why you have been stopping and learn really effective, super simple, there's those words again, tools to help you keep going on that project to reach the finish line you declare and future projects, including pieces of that project. Many people do a piece of a larger project in GSSD and some do a small standalone project. All of that will work. And I'm going to be there all the way, just like I am right here, loving you and helping you get unstuck. I'm giving you the tools that you can use over and over again, the micro practices, the insights, the mindsets um, to keep dissolving how fear slips in, distorts, stops you. You can get all the details, but I hope you won't click away until later. I hope you'll stay right here with me at jenniferloudon.com forward slash GSSD. And, um, we start on Monday, September 25th, but for those of you who are already having anxiety right now saying, how can I ever pick one project? Oh my God, I have so many projects I want to do. Oh my God, you can't tell, I can't just pick one project. We have the most brilliant pre-module to help you go step by step through a process to help you choose what you'll work on on the course. And then baked into the course itself, we'll help you keep re-choosing, chunking down as necessary, recalibrating that finish line, and using that very process to help you learn even more about what you work. Part of the genius of GSSD is you work on something you care about and you learn how to do it better at the same time, and they come together. That's, that's part of what's great. So if you know that you're like freaking out already about um, being a multi-passionate person or think, you know, not being able to prioritize, that module is waiting for you right now. And honestly, I just think it's genius. All right. And there's also um, a wonderful bonus, my Create Your Own Mastermind group course. We used to sell that for a hundred bucks. Um, it's free as part of your bonus when you join the course because some people after GSSD in the spring did set up their own uh, masterminds from people they met so that they could continue to have support. Um, not one of those teachers who's like, I want you to work with me for a lifetime and pay me thousands of dollars. I want you to get what you need from my different offerings and then integrate them into your life and move on and do the things that only you can do in this world. All right, so it's a little bit about the course in case you're thinking about it. You can put that aside for right now and let's move in to the training. Five super simple steps because they are simple. They're so simple. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Even if you're multitasking, even if you're, you know, doing the dishes or doing some email while you're listening to me, keep an ear cocked. And if I say something that makes you go, Oh, oh my God, I, I can't do that. Or, oh, wow, maybe I should try that. I want you to write it down with pen and paper, not to type it unless you physically can't write because that we get, we learn better and we retain better when we write by hand. That's science. We use a lot of science in GSSD. And I want you to write in your own words. Don't try to recreate my words unless they make sense to you and then write those words down. But just write down whatever lands and know that this is a recording. So you can, if you're listening to it live, you can, you'll get the recording in your email. You can re-listen to anything that goes by too fast. Because I know I always talk really fast. <laughs> and you can also use the notes that you got in your email if they're easily available before the call. We sent you a really cute uh, template. Yeah. And oh my gosh, can I just stop and say that someone has just said, Shuli, am I saying your name right? Personal testimony, oh, the testimony, the GSSD course is great, life-changing for me, transformation. Oh, thank you. I needed that. You know when you care so much about something, y'all? And that desire, we have to learn to work with that desire. And I'm going to talk about that. But first, and kind of related to desire, let's go to step number one. Step number one. Um... 
And I'll get to your questions, y'all, about how the course works and, and missing things and stuff like that. Totally, we'll get to them at the end, but I just want to jump into the training for people who might not want to take the course and really want to get some value here. So I see your, your question, Emma. Um, and uh, Melanie, you could give her some ideas in the chat, and then I'll, I'll come back to that question at the, in about 40 minutes. Emma, Emma, Emma? Okay. Um, so number one. Can you, sm can you hear me sniffing? <laughs> Sniff after your inklings. Sniff after your inklings. You get sneak peeks, flutterings at the outside of your, you know, right there at the side of your vision, little moments in your heart, a grip in your belly all the time about what you care about and what the next step is. And all the time, most likely, you dismiss those inklings. You may even have built a life, and there's no shame or blame in this, technology makes this really easy these days, which is all about distracting yourself, saying yes to lots of things I call time monsters that take you away or create an environment where it's really hard to sniff after your inklings. The other thing we do when we get an inkling and we do feel it, what the next step might be on our project, our book, uh, tiling the bathroom, which was what Melissa did in last year's SSD. We dismiss them because they don't show up as flashing billboards that say, go here, go here, go here, do this, do exactly this. Oh, and by the way, here's a map. And if you do every step on this map, you will get exactly where you want to get and have exactly the outcome you want by exactly the, um, the time that you want to reach. And so we dismiss the inklings and we dismiss the truth, which part of us knows, our heart knows, that we're wayfinders. We are making the map up as we go along, as we follow those inklings and take action on them. Not just sniff them, not just feel them, but take action on them. You know more then you think you do about what you want and what to do next on your scary shit. I guarantee you, like I guarantee you, I'm sitting here in my office, it's a little bit warm and I kind of wish the air conditioning would go on. I guarantee you because I have literally worked with thousands of students in this course and other youth times, like many, many, many times over the years I've used this material on my writing retreats, coaching clients, and when we create the conditions for ourselves, which are simple and which we will do in GSSD and which we will do here in a moment, to calm the body, to welcome ourselves as we are and to let that sense of inkling, that desire, be paid attention to. Something else is revealed and then we can sniff and pay attention and move from there. It's like me the other day. I went running a little too late in the day and it was getting hot on the return trip and there was on a really exposed trail and I was running from shade pocket to shade pocket, right? And I was thinking this is kind of how life works, right? Stop in the shade, reassess, cool down, have a little water, listen. And then, yeah, okay, go. And then Carson, in that case, I could see the next thing is shade. And I knew where to go. But often our inklings will work that same way. And so every now and then, if you see me down here, I'm looking at my notes. I want to make sure that I get everything in. Okay. Um, so let's do it. Let's listen to an inkling. <laughs> so this is what I want you to do. You've probably done this in, in, in lots of places like yoga class. I just want you to scrunch your whole body up as best you can wherever you are. Like scrunch up your face and scrunch up your hands and your feet if you can. Scrunch up your belly. Oh, hold on really tight. Hold your breath. Hold a little more. Scrunch a little tighter. And then let it go. And if you can, close your eyes. And let your awareness come into the inside of your mouth. Don't visualize the mouth, but feel it. This is very calming for the, the brain. The roof of the mouth, the left side of the mouth, the right side of the mouth, the tongue. Just take a moment there. Take a moment to feel the palm of your left hand 
again, not to visualize it, but feel heat, sensation, cool, or it might be touching something. And then the right palm, same thing. And then both palms at the same time in your awareness and the inside of the mouth. And then notice what sensation or breeze you can feel against your forehead. Mouth, forehead, both hands at the same time. Just settling into the body in an effective way. The mind may still be busy. There may be noise or distractions. It's okay. You might want to sigh. And then just notice gently, lovingly ask yourself, what have I been interested in lately? What have I been curious about lately? See if any images, inklings, quick little silver thoughts, feelings, sounds come through. And then ask yourself, is this familiar? Have I seen or heard or felt this before? Maybe dismissed it, turned away from it, maybe not. And what's it like to welcome the experience, including if it's just blankness right now? Sometimes our nervous systems have been so jacked up, we can't, nothing comes, no inklings are there right away. It just takes a little more time, that's fine. Nothing to worry about. Just welcoming anything that's there, including nothing. Like, hi, hi, thanks for being here. And then if you want to stop and make a note about any inkling that showed up, it may be very faint. Remember, what we do is dismiss the faintness. You may have watched yourself do it right then. We dismiss because we think it needs to be clearer, bigger, a flashing billboard, a map. So what I'd love is if anyone wants to write in the chat box anything what that experience was like. Lisa said too many ideas, yeah. So then one of the things, and we'll talk about this a lot in GSSD, and it's a really wonderful part of the pre-course, is part of that is Lisa really embracing the fact that we're humans. And we have a um, human scale life. And we have to sometimes do a little bit of grieving about the fact that we are not one of those goddesses or gods with all the arms and all the lifetimes. And so sometimes we make a, most of the time, we realize that we could have all those different lives, but we get to choose what's juicy or possible right now and make some effort towards it. And this story that I, I can't choose because there's so many ideas and I can't say no to them, to my, in my experience, and your, your, your experience, of course, may be very different, is that it's fear showing up. It's fear of being mortal. It's fear of saying, yep, this is all I got, this life. Let's grab it. Let's live it with one of these ideas right now. Um, yeah, so that's fine that you have, yeah, and um, someone said decluttering their life, the desire to stay on the path, those are beautiful, and Charlotte, the desire to stay on the path then becomes what's the next simple inkling to do that? What's the next simple step to do that? What's the next simple step to declutter my life? And that sense of having trouble sorting through or getting unstuck, it really does show up in, instead of the big story, the big story that's showing up and getting stuck or too many ideas, we start to learn to dive underneath that. What's the next simple step? And they kind of give you a formula for that in GSSD. 
Um, Carolyn said, I got clarity. It's not about writing a specific story that is most important. It's about playing with writing stories, learning how to do it and what works for me. Yes, Caroline, yes. That's what I'm talking about. That's the way we begin to shift our mindset. And everybody, it takes some practice for some of us. No problem. It works. Um, and Mary said, I tend to say that this inclination is just another bright, shiny object. Could this be perhaps a way to move away from the current project? Um, can you say a little bit more about that, Mary? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Maybe something showed up that's new. Um, and then that's about, um, that might be a different question that we can get to at the end. How do we stay committed? Um, but I'll come back to your question. I just want to be aware of our time because I'm only on number one. I got to get all through all five. <laughs> so let's get to number two now. And that is look away from the outcome. Look away from the outcome. One of the things that I see, and it definitely comes up in this conversation that we've just been having in the chat box, is when we focus on outcome, uh, which you know we all love to do because it's fun to fantasize about it, um, what can happen is, it's like when I do the uh, mini crossword puzzle in New York Times with my husband and we get the wrong word in, which we did last night, <laughs> and then we could not get this final clue for this word because we had put in saner and stopped questioning it, and it was actually sager, not saner. So we finally had to give up and you know just ask for the puzzle to be shown for us. So we get into this idea that there's one form for our project or one purpose for our life. And that actually shuts down the truth, which is there's many purposes and many forms that each of our projects can take. The idea that there's one purpose or one form creates insane pressure to make the right decision, to take the right action. Well, recognizing the fluidity of our talents, our genius, and the many good enough lives, even great lives, the good enough projects, the even great projects sometimes we can do frees us up. We also know from a really growing body of research that when we focus on outcome too much, we lose the energy to take action. It's as if our imagination says, oh, right, you got that, you did it already. And I see it, it, it just a sort of tangled thought pattern I watch it myself. I watch it sometimes around running. Like I'll do a big run, I'm training for this trail fest in a few weeks, which is the most miles I'll ever run in, um, over the course of three days. And, and I'll be like, oh man, I'll be like celebrating that big run. And I sort, of, I, I sort of focus on the outcome of doing that big run so much. And then I can't let it go to go on and focus on the process of continuing to run. Um, there's a great uh, story from my own life when I started off in my career. Uh, I wanted to be a filmmaker and I wanted to be a director and I pretty much early on in film school at USC went, you know, I, I really don't, I don't have what it takes to be a director. I really don't have a very good visual sense. I'm not good at telling people what to do. I was only, you know, 19, 20 years old at the time. I've gotten a lot better at telling people what to do. And, um, and so I moved to screenwriting and I'd always written and always loved reading. I always been one of those kids, but um, screenwriting, like, yeah, I can do this. I can really do this. And then I didn't, I didn't have easy success. I had a lot of silly stories about it, but I was so attached y'all to that outcome. It was like this, I had to be a successful screenwriter and it had to happen soon. And my life got smaller and smaller and more and more unhappy and I got more and more depressed. And it was in a moment of really great surrender that really did, I do not exaggerate to you, I think it was about 25, um, I felt like dying. It felt like a form of dying and I really gave up. I was, I, only for a short period of time, I was gonna take a break. But I really felt this great letting go. And it was in that moment that the title for the Woman's Comfort Book popped into my head as clearly as if one of you said it to me. And as out of the blue, uh, writing a self-help book, even reading self-help books, like that whole world was as foreign to me right now as like, I don't know, being a Navy SEAL might be, <laughs> you know? Just like that can happen. And I was listening to that wonderful podcast, Hidden Brain, that if you don't know, it's really great. And there was a story about Helen Ellis. She was, had this very clear and very particular outcome, very narrow about what it meant to be a successful writer. And she meant moving to New York, it meant writing every day, it meant writing a certain amount of time, it meant writing fiction in a certain way. And she, after a number of years, sold a successful uh, first novel, 
and it was successful. But then her next four novels, no one wanted to buy. And she became more and more distraught and, and, and lost purpose in life and just gave up on writing entirely and focused on another inkling, another desire, which was decorating. She loved vintage decorating and she got married over that process and, and, and just decorated. I don't know whether they moved back to the South. She's Southern or when they stayed in New York, it wasn't clear to me, but decorated this apartment uh, that they had in this very particular way and then she started for some reason tweeting about being a housewife because what would happen is people would say to her at parties what do you do and she'd be like I'm a housewife and so she started to really claim it and she started to write these you know southern lady housewife tweets and curate them and edit them and get, get gain a following and eventually she's like I think 16 years or something after her first novel she wrote a book of short stories loosely based on those tweets. And yes, it was successful, and yes, she's gone on to do other things, but that's not the point. The point is, we both of us let go of a particular very narrow outcome, and then new ideas and possibilities that were always there had time and room to grow. So what would be satisfying for you to be working on where are those inklings taking you, no matter what the outcome? And even more than that, what outcome is taking the fun out of the process? Because this is what I saw happen with some of the folks in GSSD last time. They realized that the process to get to a particular outcome wasn't fun, and that's why they weren't doing the work. That's why they weren't getting to where they wanted to be. And then two things happened, depending on the person. Some of them went, that's not the outcome I want. And then they found another outcome and a new process that was fun. Some of the time, most of the time, not all of the time. And some people found that it was by letting go of a very strict, tight outcome that the process could be fun again. And then maybe that outcome changed or not, but the way they held it then did. So when the process has been choked to death, by our attachment to and our overfocus on the outcome. One way or another, we're going to lose energy and focus. I'm writing a memoir right now. I'm starting, I'm still, I guess, in the second draft. I'm starting another part of the second draft. And I told a friend uh, the other day, not for the first time, I don't, I, I want that memoir to be published. I want it to do well. I want it to reach a lot of people, of course, but I literally don't focus on that. I focus on the process because I love it. I love how it's changed me. It's changed my life. I love how, I love the writing. I love learning about writing and learning to, to detach from the outcome. I must be famous. The book must do well. To how am I going to get in there and learn and enjoy and maybe be able to teach someone my students what I'm learning and be able to teach myself how to see my life differently. I am already over the moon with my three years of work on that. All right. Um, so there's a story last time from Heidi. Uh, Heidi, if you're on here, hi. And um, she was near, it was near the end of the course and she had a bad day. And the day just, like, work stuff was hard, and she didn't get to her writing, which was she had a writing goal that was um, part of GSSD finish line, and she was really getting down on herself. And she took some of my advice, which was to speak to herself like she would her best friend. And she laid down on the bed and wrote 10 things that she had actually done that day, paying attention to what's real, taking in the good, which is something that you can practice right now. We practice in GSSD. And then she looked back at all the writing she had done over the last seven weeks. And she realized that even though she hadn't made progress that day and that the outcome may or may not happen when the course was done, it did, but she wasn't sure at that point, the actual work she had done and the process of it was freaking amazing. And that's part of what we have to learn to pay attention to. And when we get attached to that particular rigid outcome and we overfocus on it, fear has a way of draining away all of our energy and purpose and ability to do the work and turning the process into torture. Yeah. So any thoughts on that? I'm just going to remind you, anything that lands with you, please write it down in your own handwriting, in your own words, so it will stick. Learning isn't passive. So for you to get some value out of this next 15, 20 minutes we're here together, you're gonna have to make some notes. So helpful already, great. Does anybody have any takeaways in their own language that they would like to put in the chat box and by sharing might help make it more real for you? 
I'm going to have some water while you think about that. I was never a fan of ice water till I moved to Colorado. Now I just love it. <laughs> All right, so just going to go back for a second because those of you who are just joining in, we're, we're about to get to number three in our simple, super, super simple steps. Number one is sniff after your inklings. You know more right now about what to do next, but you're dismissing it. Because you don't think it's big enough or clear enough or you're unwilling to embrace one idea. One simple step. Number two, look away from the outcome. <laughs> outcomes are great, especially when we get towards the finish line. We all have them. We all want them. It's not that you make the outcomes wrong or go, ah, no outcome. But it's that we get too attached. We fantasize, think about it, and focus on it too much. Yeah. And, and, and Tenka said, just going to work hard on not thinking about the outcome. It's tough. Yeah, and don't, don't get into a war with outcome, right? I'm not suggesting that. It's just like, hi, outcome, you're there. I would love that. That would be really brilliant. And, you know, of course I want that. Everybody wants that. Of course that I, I want my memoir to be published and sell a million copies. Of course I do. Who wouldn't? Uh -huh, I love you. And right now, what's the next simple step? What would be satisfying and delicious about this process right now? And it's training and it's practice. Um, good. Lots of great takeaways, everybody, if you can read them in the, um, in the comments. And then I'll go back and read some of them. But I want to make sure that I keep going to number three. Number three. This is one of my favorites. And those of you who worked with me before totally know this. Your animal self is your best friend. And by that, I don't mean your dogs or your cats or your birds or your horses. I mean this, this body. This is your best friend. And essential, as in you must use this. <laughs> essential and reliable, as in it's always here way to work with fear that we consistently overlook we give we say it but we don't do it is to come in through the body when we're stuck when we can't choose when we're overwhelmed when we're worried about what people are going to say all the different stories that you have the body is our way in we love that line from mary oliver's poem wild geese so much for a reason, you know that line, you only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Why do we love that line so much? You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves because it's telling us, trust this animal, connect with it. It needs to feel safe. We need to learn micro practices and then actually practice them <laughs> to settle down. We are animals, and for most of our evolution, we were prey. And prey, the part of our brain that still wonders if it is prey, when it wants to do something outside of your emotional immune system, freaks out and tries to get you to stop. It's just like pollen. If any of you have allergies, we all know pollen in general is not toxic. <laughs> it's not a problem. But our physical immune system says, pollen, no, no. And the actual pain comes from our reaction, our immune system's reaction to the pollen, not the pollen itself. So it's the way out of that reaction when we have allergies might be medicine, but the way with the emotional immune system, the way out is through the soft animal of our body and letting it be our friend. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, there's a million ways to do it and you already instinctively know them. So don't let the mind hijack it and say, okay, I have to learn this whole new way to, to calm my body down and how will I do that? I know, just like I know I have a yellow shirt on underneath this shirt, <laughs> that you know how to calm the soft animal of your body. And I also know that trauma, which happens to so many of us and stays in our body, and I know that technology hijacking our dopamine, and I know the pace of life, and I know the way that we can teach our brains and nervous systems to be in hyperarousal takes some time and a little bit of effort consistently to calm back down. 
So a couple of tips, one of which I know you all know from GSSD and, and writing retreats with me and the writing oasis, but if you don't, and it just bears repeating anyway, is to actually see if you're safe. In any given moment when the stories are running away and you're feeling stuck and you don't know what to do next and um, you're so worried about what other people think and the fact that you don't have training in this or you care so much about it like I was at the start of the call, you better believe before I started this camera, this is what I did. I went, is there anything here that can eat me? You can use your own words. You can't tell your mind to do this. You can't tell your mind that it's safe. You have to actually, I'm letting people, I'm turning people's videos off so they don't have to be on video. They don't want to. Um, you actually have to let, you actually have to check out your environment so that it's, um, so that you actually know. That's the, the reptilian brain, the prey part of your brain um, uh, needs to know that, okay? And then you need to do something to kind of calm down. You need to do something to calm down. What could that be? What's pleasant for the soft animal of your body? Is it Sighing, is it rolling the shoulders back? Is it putting your hand on your heart? Um, Melody Moore, who's a wonderful psychologist and friend, told me that rubbing these parts of our neck is very good for relaxing ourselves and releasing um, oxytocin. And from that relaxation, which your mind will tell you, you do not have time to do, you are not safe to do. Your mind is wanting to act like your immune system with pollen. Stop, freak out, freak out. And what we actually want to do is not listen to the mind, but go in through the body. Go in through the body. And don't try to make yourself go from zero to 100, from freaked out to totally calm. No, too much to ask. Just say, I'm going to take three breaths and exhale noisily. Okay, now what? Oh, maybe I'll, what did that woman say on that video? She said something about look around and go, hmm, am I safe here? Hmm, okay, all right. Hmm, okay, huh, that's weird. But you know what? Actually, I am okay here. Huh, huh. What was it that I wanted? What was I wanted to do next? And take a moment to feel the desire to take your next step. Desire is energy. Desire will help you move forward. But again, going back to step number one, only if you don't keep dismissing it. I'm looking at my notes for a second. Um, I love this from one of our GSSD people last time. She, when I asked about takeaway, she says, only one takeaway. It's so hard to decide. But I will say one of the biggest takeaways that I have is knowing for a fact that I have room in my life for working in my novel no matter what else is going on. I don't have to be in the mood. And it's divine and delicious to feel the desire and use that as a way in. The only way we feel is by going in through the body. And someone said, what if there are things that can eat you, if a terrorist is a block away, et cetera? Well, because the truth is, which is incredibly you know, existential, the truth is, is we only actually live in this moment. So if we're actually safe in this moment, um, that's all that we can count on. And when we say that there might be terrorists a block away, or there might be a meteor or an airplane crashing towards us, we actually have no way of knowing that or controlling that. And that's, again, fear's way of hijacking us from what we could be calming down, settling down, coming in through the body, and taking action right here. Uh, okay, so... Again, please make any notes about anything in your own language in uh, pen, with pen and paper. That will really help you retain anything that you want to use. And I'll ask you again for some takeaways when we get through the next two steps, because that will also help make it real for you, help it stick, and help other people learn 
And part of what we're about here is definitely creating community. And that was one thing that I just love so much about, I love about everything that I create, but the GSSD community, just such smart, caring, um, generous people. All right, so let's go on to step number four. Number four, love small, forget significance. Love small, forget significance. So over and over again, in my own life, in all of my students' life, and in this course, what I find are small steps, done in the way that I'm about to describe them, are the most powerful and most dismissed tool to get your scary shit done. Or as Mel on my team says, it's better to run five minutes every day than telling yourself you'll run six miles three times a week and it never happens, right? What I see is we have all of these stories that we've gleaned from the personal growth world and the coaching world and the, you know, education and be big and dream big and, and, and that, that can be fabulous, but it also has a shadow with it. And we believe that we either have to go big or go home. And either our project has to be really, really big and completely overwhelm us because we're not living up to our potential and has to have a lot of significance. Or it's that the project is real and we really care about it, but by taking action on it, we're gonna take it out of dreamland. We're gonna take it out of possibility into reality and that really scares the shit out of us. Um, small steps, they're not special. They're not gilded. They're not sexy. Um, I had one student tell me recently that I blew her away um, years ago because she was really focusing on, you know, everything needing to be big and needing to be grand and not being able to prioritize and not being able to pick and small steps were for losers. And, um, and I really held her feet to the fire and said, you know, what makes you think, and this sounds so cool, but I said it was such love and in the context, what makes you think that you're that big of a deal and that you're that powerful? And um, that's part of the story that we gently have to pry ourselves away from. Because when we make any project or any sense of purpose in our life so significant, forget it. Of course we're terrified. And of course small steps in breaking it down aren't going to work. But then there's a couple places that I see small steps go south. One of them is continuing to attach small steps to an outcome. But in this case, it's that we do the small step and that we do it right, or we do it well, or we do it in a polished way, or we do it in a way that we can immediately see something come back to us from the world. I can't tell you how many writers I work with who've had a successful blog, and then for whatever reason, they transition away from it, and they want to, or they want to write something longer, like a book, but they're not getting the binnies of comments and likes and sharing on social media, and they've got addicted to it, right? So we do the same thing with our small steps. Did it work? Was it good enough? Do people see me? And then we, when that doesn't happen, which most of the time it's not because small steps are just small steps, we, we dismiss small steps. And we say, well, that didn't work. Breaking things down doesn't work. So we have to learn to do small steps, see them for ourselves, celebrate them for ourselves, and not judge them. So they're about doing the work, not how did the work go or what did it get me or assessing the work that we did, right? Now, if you're doing something with your hands and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, the birdcage is actually coming together, that kind of assessment, um, you know, there may be some kind of assessment as you're going along with your small steps. That's important, clearly. The other mistake I see people making with small steps is not connecting it. I know this is going to sound like I'm completely um, contradicting myself, but not connecting it to something they really care about. So they get their head down, and this is so me, I bust myself here. I get my head down, I'm like, this is on my list, I'm doing it, here's my small step, I'm doing it, you know, I'm a dog with a bone. We have to stop every now and then and go, am I moving towards something I care about? Which is actually different than getting attached to outcome, y'all. It's like, do I care about, um, do I care about writing this book? Am I enjoying the process of um, getting healthy? Do I care about building a side hustle? And when we don't know, then it becomes a process of, of all of the tools that we learn in GSSD, of again, um, listening to our inklings and our desire, calming our body down. So small steps, 
I know it's not a new idea, but the way you've been doing them, if it's not connected every now and then, putting your head up and going, do I care about this? Am I enjoying the process? Um, and am I doing small steps and seeing them and celebrating for them for myself versus assessing them constantly, judging them? Um, that, those are the game changers. Um, <laughs> this is a great question. Someone asked, uh, oh, and Hannah said, small also helps focus on the process versus the outcome. Absolutely. We, it's, this is the thing I can do. I can write 500 words today. I can tile this part of the shower today. I can call five people back that I've met at a networking meeting and have some notes ready to go to connect with them about their problem that I may be able to solve with my business. I can do those things. Whether they hire me or not is not the point. Whether those 500 words end up in the book and they sing with beauty and meaning is not the point. And then Ronnie said, how do we appease that part of us that has high expectations attached to the outcome, like appeasing a God? That's a brilliant question, Ronnie. It's a matter of these small micro practices. It's a matter of noticing that we do the thing, let's say in this case, 500 words or three pages or 20 minutes of writing. And then we notice that this is how we have habituated ourselves. And it means nothing. I've habituated myself to think that this has to be brilliant and that I have to have an outcome and that, you know, and that I want to sit here and fantasize for the rest of the day about being on Oprah. Ha! Oh, I'm so adorable. Oh, I loved you so much, Jen. You're so sweet. Okay, maybe we'll take a break and do something fun for a minute. And then we can, um, and then we can move on to our next small, simple step, which may be on our, our project that we care about or maybe like getting the laundry done. So it's just, it's really about beginning to notice and bring awareness and kindness to that story. Yeah, <laughs> someone said, I mean, Kyla said, I'm going to clean one drawer today. Exactly. I love it. And Rebecca said, I often have to tell myself to remember the why, the joy, while well, I'm doing the how to help me push past doubt and feeling the desire. And that's one thing we do in a lot of my work. We do a lot at GSSD, learning to allow our bodies to relax and feel the desire and begin to prioritize. And Ronnie, this is another answer to your question, to prioritize feeling and noticing the desire, the pleasure that maybe we took in that 500 words, the interest, the, the um, concentration, and noticing that, putting our attention on that, is just, that's what we begin to learn to do versus putting our attention on, I suck, I'm not, I'm not 500 words was nothing, um, when am I going to get this done, or whatever, you know, everyone's particular version of that would be, those are my versions of it. Um, and then Becca asked a question, but others also look toward your work with expectations and towards outcomes. Do you just not share what you're working on with others? Um, Becca, that, that, um, let me think on that and get to our last, uh, our last of our five steps, and then we'll come back and we can do that in the Q&A, okay? I want to be aware of people's time and, and, and get through the training, because that's, that's a complicated but delicious question. And feel free to like, just copy it again if I, if I forget about it and I'm missing it. Uh, and Rebecca said, only share your story with people who have earned it I like that. All right, let me go on to number five, then I'll do a little recap, and then I'll talk about the course a little bit more and take questions about everything, These, this training and the course and whatever else you got on hand. All right, so I'm just going to recap for people who I know had some trouble getting on Zoom. Number one was sniff after your inklings. Yeah, what, what's the next step? What's pulling you? It may be very slight. Don't dismiss it. Number two, look away from the outcome. We all want outcomes. We're not at war with them, but we stop focusing on them rigidly because we lose energy and we lose opportunities and we get in our way with it has to be big. Number three, your animal self, by which I mean this beautiful body, is your friend. Go in through the body regularly, a minute here, two minutes here, five minutes here, to calm the nervous system. Essential essential to getting your scary shit done. Number four, love small, forget significance, forget your potential, pay attention to what you're working towards every now and then, but then declare small steps that are dependent on you and find the joy, turn towards the desire. And number five, number five of our fifth of our super simple steps to go from here to done is you are not your work. 
You are not your art. You are not your writing. You are not your business. You are not your projects. You are not your parenting. You are not your house. You are even not your health. This is a hard earned lesson and you can tell how adamant I am about it. It took me so many years to get this in my bones. You are not your work. And I've seen and worked with so many creative people who think that if their work is done well, if it is received well, if it is, you know, growing, making money, being accoladed, getting shows, whatever your version is, then they are worthwhile. And when it goes south, when it doesn't go the way they imagined or the way they hoped, which it happens to all of us, they are devastated and they get depressed and they feel worthless and they stop working. So we begin the process of untangling. And for some of you, you've already done it, in which case, yay! <laughs> and for some of you, you're like, mm, halfway there. And others of you are like, are you kidding me, Jen? And I've, I've been along that continuum. Most of the time I'm here at this, this last continuum of I'm not my work. Doesn't mean I don't get triggered. Um, doesn't mean I don't still compare myself to others, but I'm able to let it go a lot easier. We start to untangle, to stop confusing our humanity, our beingness, our, I would say, divinity. This one expression of the life force with any one thing that we do or accomplish in the world. Yes, even our relationships, even our parenting. And we spend more time establishing a sense of delight and connection with the simple act of being alive. And we begin to detach more and more often from the thoughts that tell us that a particular outcome or a particular dream determines or means anything. Sure, it's fun to be successful. Sure, it's fun to finish stuff. I mean, that's what GSSD is about. But in the end, and I talk about this repeatedly in the course, in the end, it's really just a game. It's a game that this life force and this form of Jen or this form of Ronnie or Rebecca or Becca and Ellen and all of you wonderful people who are here on the phone get to play with. And so we begin to be, begin to be curious about that process. We begin to be curious about what our thoughts are about why things have to mean what they mean. And we begin to untangle um, our identity and realize it's not on the line. And we do that um, by using all of our first four steps. We learn to go in through the body and relax in the sense of just being, that we're safe, that everything's okay. And yeah, it takes practice, but it is totally available to every human. We begin to break things down into small steps that are dependent only on us. So that that sense of always judging everything we've done begins to break up get softer, and with it, a lot of the identification with our work. Uh, we begin to, you know, detach from uh, wanting things to be a certain way all the time and only that way and be open to all the different possibilities of outcome. And we begin to really sniff after that sense of desire and honor it as an expression of being alive as an expression of the gratitude of getting to have a body rather than the story, this means I'm safe, this means I'm good, this means I'm worthwhile. Hmm. Yeah, and Megan just said detach, 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 so hard and so necessary. I'm actually going to say that for me it's not detach, Megan. For me it's love and play while realizing that that form that I want, so in this case, again, I want all of you to sign up for GSSD. I want, you know, I want it to be, I want everyone in the world to take it, you know, whatever that might be. I want my book to be fabulous, that I can hold that with this sense of, of love and lightness and playfulness versus this is me. I remember, and I know I've told some of you this story before, but I remember when I was early in my career, I think my second Maybe, only, maybe I was just my first book or maybe my second book was published, but I was in Las Vegas and I was going to go on stage and it was a big speaking engagement. I was still very new to speaking. I mostly hated it. 
And um, I was about to go on stage and I was in my hotel room pacing around literally back and forth out to the window where I would look out at the strip and then back to my bed saying out loud, I am not my work. I am not my work. I am not this one performance on the stage. Um, so this is a big subject, but I had to mention it. I can't bring it, break it down into, you know, again, the first four steps are the way I believe and just entertaining the thought. Yeah, be the neutral observer in the movie of your project or life. Yeah. <laughs> and then Emma said, my identity is not on the line when I offer out my work for public perusal. Oh my God, life changing. And let me just say, when I'm done with this call and we're going to wrap up the training part in just a sec, and then I'm here for as long as you want for Q&A. When I'm done with this call, I'm going to do some soothing for myself because there is a part of me that does feel like, how did I do? There's a part of me that'll be like, did you do a good job? Wait, you didn't say that. And I don't think that was a good enough story. And you should have, you know, you should have said this more. And I'll just be very loving towards that self. I might take a little nap. I might take a shower if I'm showers, very calming. Um, I might do a little, you know, stretching and moaning and run, rolling around on the floor and just welcoming. Yeah, of course, I would always love this outcome to be perfect. And I don't have to hold it with those white knuckles. I don't have to hold it as any story or sense that has anything to do with my core, natural, wonderful, whole self. And neither do you. So the fact that we might react to it is what I'm, is what I'm suggesting doesn't mean anything either. It doesn't mean we're, I'm not suggesting I'm, you or me or any of us need to be like, oh yes, I'm never ruffled and I never care about outcome and my identity is nothing. No, it still comes through. We just don't get with time and practice so attached to it for as long. All right, let me tell you a couple more things about the course really briefly and then open it up for questions and go back for some of the great questions that you asked before. So when I launched this course for the first time, I've taught pieces of this in many different forms. I taught pieces of it in other online courses and in a lot in my writing retreats, et cetera. I, I was actually kind of, I was nervous because the same thing I shared earlier with this, I just care about it so much. But I was also promising people something very concrete. You will go from here to here. You will declare a finish line and it may well change because the finish line is often really too big and that's part of what people learn. You get to declare it. It's not dependent on any kind of other, anybody else doing anything. It's dependent on you and I'm going to teach you how to do that. But I was afraid that people wouldn't really be able to do it. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> you know, um, people, some of the people who joined the course have tried to do this thing, whether it was build the website and get pictures of their pottery up or, um, you know, get more clients for their business or their side hustle or finish the course or um, uh, rewrite the short story or um, outline the memoir or I mean you know just a huge range of projects finish the kitchen uh, make the second kitchen sink work <laughs> for someone I know is on the call um, and it worked it worked if people showed up and did the asterisk lessons in each of the modules and did the work. And sometimes life got in the way for some people, but the material was there forever. So they did, they've come back and said, yes, I finished. They email us regularly. I finished later, but it worked. And people got their book outlines done. They got their memoir chapters written. They got their poetry submitted. They got their art shows completed. Um, those online courses outlined or launched or baited. Um, and if there's anyone here from GSSD who took it, who wants to say what they got done or anything about the experience, I will totally invite that <laughs> in the chat box. Um, yes. So, um, okay. So I'm just going to keep going about the course. I just was looking at all your great comments and questions for a second there. Um, the things that surprised me about teaching GSSD, so I was like, will it work? And then it did. But then what surprised me about actually teaching it was how many people kept saying, oh my gosh, doing small steps the way you outline it, Jen, really, really works. Um, getting out or performing, judging what I'm doing and turning and celebrating myself and seeing what I'm doing was, a, I just couldn't believe what a game changer it was for people. Um, I was also surprised by how when people let themselves off the hook, from doing something giant or epic 
and chose something that might be part of that epic, like a chapter, or something that not quite as epic, and stopped dismissing it and focused on that they wanted to do it, and then the lessons in the course and doing them together, how that burst open, like their entire view of themselves and what was possible. I also was, uh, I wasn't surprised by how great a community formed on Facebook and on the live calls like this and how supportive people were each other and stayed in touch with each other. Um, but I was really, uh, I was really moved by that. So speaking of community, there's two versions of the course I want to tell you about. There's a DIY version. Some of you are like, ooh, community, ooh, Facebook, ooh, live calls, don't want any of that. We have a totally DIY. You get the lessons every week. You get a remind, you, kind of, you get a like stay engaged email once a week. There's video, they're all little cute little pieces so you can engage, get a little bit, do the work. Um, there's video notes, there's templates if you need them in any case, you know, when we're, when we're giving you a template that you need. Um, there's resources. So you get all of that and you get it for 197. You don't get the Facebook group or some of the other extras, which are in the total support path. And that's if you need more structure, you need more support, you need more of this kind of love and connection from me and from everybody else. More coaching, more accountability. And, um, and when you choose the total support path, you get all those amazing weekly lessons with the asterisk ones that I really, really want you to do. You get a weekly live call like this on Zoom, except for one week we take off for um, catch up and because I'm leading a writing retreat. <laughs> I get I occasionally do a random live uh, Facebook Live within the Facebook group, which you also get if I feel like there's a question coming up or something that's confused or people need some energy. Um, and then at the end, we do a um, special celebration call with a chance to win some really cool prizes. And that option is $3.97. And we offer a two payment plan for both options. So, um, and Erin can tell you about that. If you have any questions about that, you can just email her at jen at jenniferlavin.com. But it's also on the page. Um, and I was just going to say that um, Shuli said, I learned amazing skills and enhanced my centeredness and loving self-acceptance the most. And um, the course starts on September 25th, y'all. But I really, really, really want to tell you that the pre-course module, which is waiting for you right now, is amazing. So those of you who are often stuck because you have too many ideas, that course, that pre-course module waiting for you right now will change that. And, and I, want, I would love for you to give yourself time so that you're really ready to go on September 25th if you're in that place of too many, too many ideas and can't choose. It's really, in some ways, a fear question, and I'm going to help you with it. All right. Oh. And um, Shuli said, the course is terrific either way, but greatly enhanced, most delicious to do the whole package, the total support path. Yay. I love it too. I love being able to check in with you and make sure you're doing okay. But we got a ton of praise for the DIY version too. So it really, you know your learning style, you know your pocketbook. So um, yeah. Cool. So I want to go to some of your questions. Um, and I want to say, um, um, Hummingbird, who is Priscilla, said, I'm amazed how your words during this hour touched my heart. I am moved to tears thinking about um, what I have lost by not having an animal to love in my life for the past 17 years. Oh, good. Animal self here. So yeah, you can love this animal self. We always get an animal with us, even when we can't have our beloved animals. Yeah. Yay. Okay, let me get to some of your questions. Questions about the course, questions about the material. I'm going to go back and look at um, Kayla asked a question, won't more exercise give more dopamine from my own body instead of seeking it from outside? I'm not sure I understand. Could you rephrase that or remind me what I was talking about? And I'll try to answer that. Um, and do, 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 do. Christina said, these are simple, but life affirming and profound. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Um, and Lisa says, sometimes this feels hard when trying to make a living. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Lisa. I totally understand. I have a very strong fear response to when the money's not as, um, 
flowing as I want it to be. Absolutely. Um, and that's part of why with GSSD, we try to, we try to pick something maybe a little, uh, we definitely pick something that's doable within the seven weeks and why the seven week container is so profound because then we can practice all this stuff without so much pressure because there, there's just certain times in our lives when it's very difficult to learn how to respond to fear differently when we're you know living in a war zone when we're about to lose our house we, we can't learn these tools at those times um, but when we can we have a basic level of stability and then we can use that seven week container to really focus in um, we can begin to learn these things and help apply them more skillfully more of the time when the stress is high but I totally understand that. Um, Nina said, I'm still having trouble with how you look away from the outcome while still maintaining a goal. Yeah. So one, one way to think about it, and anybody else who has some uh, tools about doing this, feel free to write them in the chat box. But one way that, that I like to do, there's a couple ways I think about it, Nina. One is um, outcome for me is attached to other people responding in a certain way. So in my uh, case, it would be all of you loving this and signing up for the course, right? I, I can't actually influence that. I can influence as much, I mean, I can't determine that. I can influence it by showing up, by being abused, et cetera, but I can't, I can't determine it. So outcome is often focused on outside of me. And it doesn't mean that, it's, as I said, it's not going to come through and it's not going to be delightful or interesting to think about. But goal is focused on, and we talk about this in GSSD a lot, what can I actually do that's dependent only on me? And sometimes it's a little not concrete. Like I, one of my goals for my memoir is to show up as honestly as I can and to write as truthfully as I can. And sometimes I'm, you know, I'm feeling into my body what that means and what that looks like. It's not necessarily, um, you know, it's not as clear as I'm going to write 500 words. So I have to kind of create my own criteria around it. Um, so goal, I would say, is, is what's that thing that I hold most dear? So that an outcome is, oh yeah, I really hope other people, or this happens in the world, or I make this money from it, or I affect this many people, or that kind of thing, right? And that's going to be always true. This is human. It's wired into us. But I don't have to keep putting my attention on it and focus on it tighter and tighter. And then this goal, I'm going to look up every now and then and go, am I, how are the actions I'm doing getting me closer there? Are they sitting there? Or am I creating actions and busy work for myself to kind of divert myself from what I care about and is fear sort of hijacking me to do that or other stories hijacking me to do that? So I'll give you an example from Jessica Abel. She wrote Growing Gills. She's also wrote Out on the Wire. And she created, she spent weeks and weeks doing this very detailed um, book uh, trailer, video book trailer, graphic, you know, animated book tra trailer for the release of one of her books in France. She never actually like looked and went, is that actually supporting my goal of selling more books in France? She didn't spend some time sort of with the goal. I want to, I want to get my work out there. I don't know if it'll happen. That would be the outcome. But my goal is to what can I do using my talents and my available time to get my book out there. And in fact, nobody looks at book trailers in France. They're not a thing like they are in America. So like it was viewed by like 150 people and she spent weeks and weeks on it. So I tend to go down into my small steps, down into what I can do, and then look up. Hmm, am I getting distracted? Am I thinking, I, I, what, what, what's my source for why this is connecting with my goal? And then keep treating that outcome with lightness. Um, so I hope that was useful. Oh, there's 14 new messages at the bottom, y'all. <laughs> um, yes, Carolyn asked, do we still have access to the private Facebook group? Yes! It is alive forever, and the first GSSD people are in there. So you can think of them as mentors, and, and, and you can see the experience that they've had. So it's, just, it's really this living document. Um, yes. And Melissa said, is there a problem, conflict, overwhelm connected with um, GSSD overlapping with the Vermont retreat? Well, welcome to the Vermont retreat. Um, no, you might end up, um, you might end up, if you, you might end up being a week later because you want to take that week off. People were doing GSSD. Um, they were, they were, 
I, people are often taking a course from me where they're off on retreat on me. And it'll be really funny. They'll be like, oh, I was in my room watching you on video. And now I'm out here in the living room with you in person. Um, so it might slow things down a little bit, but there's lots of free time in Vermont um, if you wanted to keep up on the lessons. And then hopefully there might be the project that you choose for GSSD, um, Melissa, will overlap with the work that you'll get done on it in Vermont. If it's a writing project, then it should all line up just fine. And there's no hurry. I mean, you know, many people finished a few days later. You know, we're always talking about, you know, here's, here's our timeline. We're holding the container for you this way. But if you need to go four days over, or you go a week over for your finish line, we're there celebrating with you. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Let's see. Got to run. Thank you, Lisa. I'm glad you like this. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Mary. Um, what about taking on more than one thing, like a writing piece and a self-care piece? I'm going, I'm pretty firm in GSSD to help you focus in on one thing. Sometimes two things are really closely braided together, but that's often where I get in and do some coaching with you and, and see that fear is showing up in a way that makes you actually want to choose two things because choosing on one thing and really desiring it and being devoted to it is scary to you. And then again, the processes in GSSD will help you with that fear. Um, so yes, um, Carol said, how do we access the module and how to pick just one thing? It is part of the course. So it's there when you sign up for the course and it's available right now. We're gonna send you a little taster of it to this list that you signed up for when you, uh, you'll see that coming in in the next few days. Um, so that'll also help, but the whole full meal deal experiential with the videos and the audios and everything is, is inside the course. Um, Oh, thank you, Christina. It's wonderful to be with you, too. You're so welcome. Um, uh, Jennifer said she missed the first part, bummer. No problem. We'll have the recording to you shortly, and you can just play it and listen to the first part, and it works out of sequence, so you're totally fine. <laughs> Um, so a couple of people asked me questions before y'all, which I've lost because the chat's gotten so full. So please, could you find that question? And um put it back in here so i can ask it kelly asked is the course on rizuku it is on rizuku but we have a special branded version of rizuku so it, it it functions the same but it looks really beautiful and i love it because it's such an easy to use platform and again you can also download everything but what i love about rizuku is very intuitive and you can check off steps when you're done so you can really see what you've done and get that little dopamine hit um Oh, and I've got a couple questions I need to ask that were sent to me ahead of time that I want to get to. But Melanie just asked, how, can you tell me a bit about how the Facebook group functions or what it provides in terms of support? Yes. So what the Facebook group does, for those of you who are going to do the total support path, is it gives us, it gives you a place to come in and ask questions of me or Melanie or Aaron. Uh, I don't do, you know, deep coaching because it doesn't work in Facebook, but light coaching, reading things. It gives you a chance. Uh, we have certain things that we cue you to do every week, uh, including celebrating, celebrating, um, teaching you how to celebrate. And some of that is in the course itself, of course, but we do some extra stuff in the Facebook group. I think the main thing it, it does, and anyone who's in GSSD can completely, um, uh, you know, chime in here. But what I think it does is help you feel less alone and more supported and seen. And then if anything gets confusing, you know, it's, you're there to ask for it. Um, I saw it help a lot with when people realized they needed to chunk down their projects. Um, and I saw it just help a lot with a sense of um, when people hit the wall. Hitting the wall, getting discouraged is part of the process. And we so normalize it in JSSD and the Facebook group helps do that too. So um, I'm in there five days a week. Melanie's in there. So we're reading. We have really clear guidelines. There's no advice going on and really um, uh, ele uh, sharing of resources happens too. Allison asks, what would you say is a typical time commitment per week? Yeah, I would say you'll need what you need for your project. So maybe that's an hour or two hours a week. Some people it was more, some people it was less. And then about for the DIY version, probably about 60 to 90 minutes. And then if you want to do the live call or hang out on Facebook any week or listen to the recording, um, that would add another, um, you know, 
hour. Um, again, that's with the asterisk lessons, and that's with not trying to be a good student or get it right, but just get what you need to move on to your project, knowing the material is there and the processes are there to tap into again and again. Um, good, good. And the live calls like this are recorded, and you'll get a link. Um, and we also, um, I think we also post them to the Facebook group, but I'm not sure. But anyway, we, we're, we're excellently organized, and you'll find um, the support um, of our team just amazing. We're really good at, um, I'm really devoted to, even though it's an online learning process, to doing everything I can to keep you engaged and getting your scary shit done. I'm deeply committed to that, and so is my team. Uh, good. Susanna said hand to heart. Be gratitude for this to you at the Writer's Oasis. Excellent, Susanna. Uh, Melanie said the key is working on your scary shit and then you use the tools when you bump up against your stuff. Right. Versus what we might, and we work with you on this because this comes up for people, but, I, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm not doing everything in the course. I'm not doing every lesson. That's not the point. The point is, am I learning what I need to get my scary shit done and I'm doing it differently? Am I doing it more effectively? Am I doing it with more joy or ease? That's what we keep focusing on. That's what changes things. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to a couple of questions I got ahead of time. If I missed your questions, please um, come and ask them again if you asked them earlier and I missed them. Um, and Ronnie, I'm just, is, is this a step beyond the Oasis? This is a step separate. So the Writer's Oasis is ongoing support. Um, very flexible to take care of yourself, to stay committed to your writing or your other creative projects and support to get that writing done. GSSD tools, some of them I definitely talk about in the Writer's Oasis, but this is a structured experience with a lot of information and insights that there's not time. So this is a seven week, we do this, we do this, we do this, it builds on each other. It's a course. The Writer's Oasis is, is a place to keep finding yourself, recommitting to what's important to you, especially your writing and getting it done. So that Writer's Oasis totally supports GSSD. It's a great place to be in before, during, or after, but it's separate. It's very separate. Um, but there's an overlap in love and some of the same concepts. Um, but what I always want the Writer's Oasis to be is a place you can come and go and get what you need to stay on track with what's more important to you. In GSSD, I very much want you to learn a set of school skills, practices, and tools to get your scary shit done forever differently. Okay, bye, Leslie. Good. Okay. I'm gonna go to Sandy's question, which I love so much and I know we can all relate to. She says, my dream is to write and I'm scared shitless because I'm terrified of failure. I'm with you, Sandy. So she says, I don't start. Fear has ruled most of my life. I've been following you for about two years. I've been working on overcoming my fear for two years. I'm not getting any younger. And that's true for all of us. Other than just do it, can you please recommend where to start? I've done no formal training. I've taken small baby steps forward and then jumped right back. I feel like people would laugh and say, what are you doing here if I attended a writing retreat? I don't know why I'm so scared. Well, Sandy, my love, I would never say just do it. Um, while taking action is one of the most transformational things we can do, when our emotional immune system is up, on our, up in our grill, so to speak, there's no way we can take that action. Um, and it's cruel um, to say to someone, just do it. Um, what I think would really, really help you, and I so hope you're here or that you're listening later, is to realize that to write is one of those giant, significant, projects. We all do it to ourselves. I want to be a writer. I did it to myself when I was younger, both, you know, that whole screenwriting story. I have to be this and I have to be successful at it. And it was so huge and so overwhelming. And I, I look back at my poor little 25 year old self now and just go, oh, Jen, I wish you knew what you knew now. So one of the keys is to take a little tiny project, a little tiny aspect of writing that doesn't feel frightening, that doesn't feel overwhelming. It might be so small. And then use the tools that will teach you to get it done. Um, part of the fear is speaking when it says, but I have no formal training. Well, I don't have any formal training either. Yeah, I went to film school. I took two or three writing classes. Yes, I've taken lots of writing classes here and there. I don't have an MFA. I don't want an MFA. I'm so glad I don't have formal training. So what I'm saying is that is not to you, is not to dismiss it, but to realize that fear hijacks an 
all us in all kinds of creative ways. And it has all kinds of narratives that function as, again, an emotional immune system to try to keep us right here where it says we're defended. So you're actually not terrified of failure. None of us are. We're terrified of being undefended. It goes back to when we were evolving. We didn't want to be outside the tribe. We didn't want to be outside the cave at night because we weren't going to make it through the night. And that's hardwired into us. And so these micro practices that we've touched on in this call begin to unwind those narratives and the resulting um, chemicals and hormones and responses in our brain and our nervous system and our body. Um, so something small and really beginning to use those micro practices to work on it. Um, I think you might be trapped in a lot of, uh, of vagueness, which is another thing that stops us. It both keeps us defended, right? Vagueness keeps us defended. I want to be a writer. But that, how would you even know if you were a writer? What does that mean? And part of what I preach in, in, in GSSD is, is how do we get specific about our human scale of life for this seven weeks? And that itself could be super life-changing for you. I also think that that sense of um, what would people think um, is another way that fear hijacks us. It's a sort of an imposter syndrome thing, right? Um, and uh, we, nobody's watching us, right? So the truth is no one, everyone would welcome us at a retreat or a writer's conference or whatever it is because, of course, they're worried that they don't belong. And so when we begin to deal and, and develop this inner resilience and inner micro practices to work with those voices that come up, um, we begin to see the, the narratives of that and be able to hold it with lightness and kindness and compassion. One of the things I find amazing, Sandy and everybody else, is that we're not wired for self-compassion. We don't come into this world knowing how to be compassionate towards ourselves. We have to learn it. And when we can wire that learning of self-compassion with, 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 with really specific promises to ourselves, really specific commitments to ourselves that we're actually able and competent to keep, and really learning to break those down and get specific about them and unattach them from performance or outcome. Um, that's, that's the life changer for you. And I, I know this will all work for you. I absolutely do. Um, so I hope that was useful. And um, if you're here, Sandy, um, or, or you listen to this later and want to ask a follow-up question, please do. Um, Good. Well, Mary said she's going to leave. Great. Um, oh, Zia said, yeah, our vagueness keeps us defended. Absolutely. Oh, hi, Sandy. Great. Is there anything more that I could say about your question? It's such a beautiful question. I so relate to it. Um, please, please do. Um, please do ask. See if I can say anything else that would help. I also want to answer Claire's question that she sent in before. My question is, how do you get your stuff done and get proper downtime when you can feel properly relaxed and switched off without feeling that your downtime is just as relentlessly programmed as the rest of the stuff you have to do? I love that question, Claire. That's like one of my favorite things ever. And it's actually one of the uh, modules. <laughs> There's a rest module in in GSSD and a couple of the ideas I'll share with you briefly that are in that module are when we actually learn how to make clear commitments to ourselves that are doable that fit in our human scale life to take action on this project in this case the seven weeks in GSSD but of course it works in any area and time in your life then we learn to celebrate that and declare that was enough and yes we have to learn that it's not natural and then we say, this is the time that I've set aside and I've kept my commitments to myself. They're not hanging over my head in some vague, un un unrealized, unclear way, making me feel weighted down. And then we get to set aside a clear period of time, Claire. It could be two hours, it could be a day, it could be a weekend. And I'm really important that that's a clear beginning and end. It doesn't have to be a time. It can be when the sun comes up, when the sun goes down, when the kids leave, when the kids come home. Um, 
after I drop mom off at memory care and before, uh, and when I wake up in the morning, you know, it can be something natural like that. And then we declare what I call a desire retreat for that time. We get to do exactly what we want. We get to sniff after our desires moment by moment. We get to pause and say, huh, am I enjoying this? Do I really like this? This is what I really want to do. Let me check this. Let me go do it a little bit more and notice. Oh, you know what? No, I'm stopping the movie right now. I don't want to watch this movie anymore. Hmm, no, I don't know what I want to do next. Hmm, well, maybe let me start making a salad and see if that's it. We begin to experiment and allow that period of time to be free form. If we feel like doing work, great, but we never have any agenda, plans, or appointments. And I find that those two together, clear commitments we're actually able to keep and, 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 and see that we kept them and celebrate and declare it was enough, plus desire retreats, even just for a couple of hours, to be totally transform, transforming in a sense of pleasure for our lives and getting renewed and getting that downtime. So thank you for that. That's a great question. Carol said, wow, declare it enough. Yeah, and that's something we do in GSSD is really learn how do we declare it as enough? How do we get rid of that sense of stuff hanging over our head? It is essential for moving forward on what we care about, Carolyn, Carol, and it is essential um, for dealing with our fear because fear loves to hijack those vague things and those things that we haven't finished because how would we even know if we finished and turn into a whole narrative that we're stuck and we're screwed and we never do what we said we would do, but we ever, never actually declared what we said we would do and how we would know we did it. Yeah. Great, Ronnie, thank you. Lynn said, must leave, sign up for the course. Yay, welcome, Lynn, welcome everyone who wants to come. And of course, you know, you have time to think about it, but if you want to do that pre-course and give yourself some time with it, I really hope you will. Um, <laughs> Shuli said, I want to encourage everyone to just do the GSSD course in terms of just do it, that's great. And lots of people said, um, Emma and Carrie said, Sandy, they're totally in there with you. Jennifer said, awesome um, question, Claire. And Sandy said, I'm crying, but I'm paying attention. Um, yeah, my darling, yeah. We cry because our bodies say, I want this. And we want what we can have. Not perfectly, not in one particular precise outcome that we may or may not have dreamed about, but we are drawn by our desire to a fuller expression of ourselves. And what we have to do is, 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 is be so gentle with ourselves and yet so devoted and devoted to taking those small, beautiful steps that are dependent only on us and that we don't judge uh, for how we did them. So I know this is possible for you to write Sandy and express yourself and learn and share your words with people. I know that. <laughs> mm. Yes, Ronnie, thank you. Um, Emma said, missing three weeks of your support and presence is making me um, question signing up. When is your next GSSD? It'll be a year from now when we'll do the live version, yeah. Um, we're going to do, and you're the first ones to hear it, we're going to do a new course in the spring. Um, and I'm going to mute whoever came on. Um, so we'll be taking the spring for that. And, um, and then GSSD again in the fall. And the DIY version will always be open for people. So, um, but the, the support is just going to be this fall. But I understand why missing three weeks would make you I, not one maybe sign up. But I do find that the Facebook group and the extras that we throw in are also, you know, they're not tied to, to just the calls. And, and that, might, that might tip the boat for Emma. And maybe not. I totally understand. Any other questions y'all got? The live calls are recorded. Absolutely. Just like this. It'll look just like this. And we'll be using this exact platform and you will get the link and you'll get the link to this recording later in the day and you can see how the recording works for you, Emma, and anybody else. Yeah, good. Anybody else have any questions? Anything I missed? I feel like there's a couple questions earlier that I said I would get to and I can't find them in the chat because we have had so many comments. So if there's somebody who has a question out there I didn't get to, I'm really happy to hang on for a few more minutes and, and help you um, with that question. You may have already signed off. Um, 
Uh, but if you're here and you want to find it in the chat yourself or just rewrite it in your own words, you don't have to find it because you probably can't find it either. <laughs> but you may be able to. Um, and Melanie, is there anything that I didn't cover that I should talk about? Think I got it all? Woohoo! I got it all. Woohoo! I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Any more thoughts or questions? Any, oh, hey, is there anybody who would like to share some takeaways from the call? Let's take a couple minutes for that. If you would chat, if you would type into the chat in your own words, one takeaway that you're gonna reflect on or put into action, it would really help you digest the call and then it will help other people um, see, see what some of the takeaways are and spark, spark their own learning. You're welcome. Sandy said, thank you, Jen. Kudos for me for making this a priority today. I'm worth it. You know, Sandy, that is a huge part of it. Claiming our desires, claiming our sovereignty, taking our seat and making it a commitment is, um, it's where it all starts. And I think it's one of the things that GSSD deeply embodies and helps with. And I think all my work does. So yay for you is right. Callie said her takeaway is small steps, no judgment about that small step. I did it, it's done, I celebrate it, it was enough, I move on to the next small step or whatever else I have to do in my life. Brilliant. I'm always relearning that, embracing it more and celebrating it more as how powerful it is. Carolyn said, the part about taking small steps, I don't just need that in my own creative work, but also in the rest of my life. Oh yeah, it works everywhere. It works everywhere. Excellent, Carolyn. Denise said, I'm taking away the reminder that I can always go in through my body when my mind is freaking out. Yes, it's with you all the time. You don't have to go get it. You don't have to pay any money for it. It's right here, beautiful body. It's right here, just the simple practice of looking around and seeing, am I safe? I'm safe right now in this moment. Let me settle, let me release a little tension. And that meditation we did, y'all, feeling the inside of your mouth, forehead, that's against your forehead, left and right hand, and then both hands at the same time. Lots of research behind that grew out of Yoga Nidra. Um, and lots of research that it's incredibly calming for the brain. And it's not that your mind won't still flick around with lots of thoughts, but it helps you um, get out of the default network and into the present-centered network. So that's a takeaway for everybody. Um, Zia said, so many takeaways, woo! One is love and play and pleasure in the process, right. And remembering if that's gone away, we need to check in with how attached we are to one particular outcome with our white knuckles. Um, or um, you know, it, it may be that you still love that process, but it's gotten overshadowed or heavied with significance or tightness. Um, Jennifer said, gotta run, looking forward to catching up when you post the recording. Yeah, thank you for being here. And Carol said, acting on the inklings is, is takeaway and aligns with my belief that more intuition comes when we listen to and use it and it goes away if we don't. Yeah, and in this case, I would say, Carol, our intuition, what we know from science, is our intuition is actually based on a tremendous amount of knowledge that we have, and we can't, we can't gain access to it in our conscious or act, um, our active memory, because our, our active memory is so slight, it can hold only maybe seven pieces of information at a time. So our intuition, when we pause and follow those inklings, is actually allowing the whole experience of our humanity and the incredible wisdom and sageness that we have to come into our working memory and direct our next step. So even for those of us who don't, believe, don't follow intuition as a mystical thing, it is totally grounded in science. And it's there, but only if it has time to come forward. Our own, our own life experience, our own knowledge. Oh, good. All right, everybody. Well, I'm just, just thrilled that this was useful for you, Kaylee, and anyone else. I'm thrilled with your takeaways. And um, it's just been a, it's been a delight to, to get to share these ideas with you. I hope you can share. You can feel my passion and also my, my commitment to GSSD. And Rebecca said, all of them were awesome. The most important for me was look away from the outcome and you are not your work. Those are the two I'm struggling with. Thank you so much for the insights. Yeah. And please know, you know, 
this is this is this is a lifetime process. And what I know in my own life, in engaging with these um, concepts that I share with you today, is is these micro practices, these five minutes here, these two minutes here, they really add up. So every time that I learn to detach from the outcome, and I'll tell you a silly story. I taught it. Um, I can I to, I'm going to totally tell on myself, y'all. Um, that's what you get when you hang out to the very, very end. So I, I taught at a new retreat center this weekend. It's called 1440 Multiversity. It's very beautiful. It's in Scotts Valley. I'll be there again in March. It's a great way to do a teeny bit of writing instruction with me and some R and R in a really beautiful setting. Um, you only get a, you only get about seven hours with me, but they're wonderful, and then you relax. And so I get there, and I'm like, there's a lot of big names there the same weekend I am, and I'm feeling very small and insignificant. And then I bring up all these kind of skills that we're talking about here and I comfort myself and I, I tell myself I'm so adorable and I settle my body and then I have lunch um, dinner with the, the program and the executive director of the place and they tell me that my program actually has the most people in it for the weekend more than these other very very big names and I'm like wow I'm such hot shit <laughs> and then I calm myself down I'm like oh you're so adorable Jen oh you're so I just love how you think you're the number of people that you have in your class that that's the same as you right and then so you know just watching my mind and calming my body and doing you know, exactly what I'm teaching you here over and over again and then the next day I think or maybe two days later um two a couple of my participants were talking about two famous writers who were going to teach there and they're like oh yeah they sold out the whole place in one day and I was like oh there's another chance there's another moment in which I could just go down and attach my identity to oh, I don't sell out the place in a day or I could just go oh honey I love you so much I love that you care so much and look at these beautiful students that you have around you right now and what an opportunity for gratitude not to judge myself or dismiss those feelings of wanting to be a big shot but also another downside them. So it was a great way to practice my own tools this weekend and very humbling, which um, is really great because humble is, it's related to earth. It's related to being grounded etymology in, in our language. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, everybody there, I, I'm so happy that we got to spend this time together. I really hope that you'll take these tools and keep them in your mind and play with them just once or twice today and tomorrow. Just begin to get a taste of it. I really hope you'll join the course. If you have um, some time and energy right now, I, I know you'll find it. Um, I can really say life changing. And if not, um, you'll continue to get some good stuff from us every week. And I'm glad you're in my life and in my community. So thank you so much, everybody. Bye.